Hi, I'm Gaku, and I'll be making a tutorial series for Victoria 2. I'm aware that there are a number of guides and tutorials out there, but in my opinion, they all fall flat for a variety of reasons. In particular, none of them really discuss the intricacies of multiplayer, or discuss the advanced strategies that you can expect to see in multiplayer games. I'm also going to structure this guide as a more practical approach to Victoria 2, rather than the typical, let's go through every single thing and explain what it does. There is a lot of information being conveyed to the player in Victoria 2. As I'm sure you're aware, it would take hours to explain it all. And I'm going to take hours explaining a lot of it, but I'm not going to go through every single thing exhaustively. There are some things that I personally do not think are important enough to warrant that sort of analysis. Now, obviously, as you play the game, these are things that you're going to encounter on your own, and you'll learn them as you go along. What I'm going to focus on are the things that I think are most important for the average player. This particular video is going to start with the absolute basics for someone who has no experience at all with Victoria 2. And if you've already played the game and you're comfortable with single player, you can just skip this particular portion. In the next parts of this series, we'll be talking about optimizations, basic and more advanced strategies, and also the intricacies of multiplayer. So unless you're a veteran, multiplayer, competitive Victoria 2 player, chances are you will learn something from this guide. That being said, if you already know the basics of how to play Victoria 2, I highly recommend you skip part 1 and go straight to part 2. In this section we'll be talking about the basics of troop movement, an introduction to diplomacy, and the basics of warfare. So first thing, let's talk about uh, unit controls. Units control very much like an RTS. You can either click and drag to select units. You can select any number of units. You can also shift, click and drag to add additional units. Or you can click individual units to select them like so. Once you have a unit selected, you can right click anywhere on the map where you have military access to move to that particular spot. Something that is very useful when it comes to reorganizing your armies. Let's say I'm playing Austria here and I know that Russia is about to attack me. I've got my units spread all over the place. Now rather than clicking individual units and telling them where to go, as you can see this takes a while, it is actually much faster to just select a lot of units in an area and tell them where to go. Now if you select all of your units and click one spot, every single one of these units will move to that spot. But you can see the small X button which will deselect the current unit. So if we deselect a unit, all the others remain selected and then we can tell those to go somewhere else. So in doing so, you can click to set a destination, deselect one unit, and tell all the others to go somewhere else. We can see the final result looks like this. We have all the units now going to this border with far fewer clicks. So that's useful if you need to reorganize a lot of units. Now for an individual unit, you can either right click to set a destination, or you can shift click to set waypoints along that given path. And you can make as complex of a route as you like. Now for an individual unit, uh, I am using the beta patch here, and the beta patch has a nice split in half button. Uh, if you are not using the beta patch, you can still reorganize your units by clicking the create new unit button, which will allow you to split off however many units you like. Once you split units, uh, if you split units like so, they will both be selected. If you use the split in half, it will only select the primary unit. Once you've split your units, you can either move them around as you need. You can do the same thing I mentioned before, which is you can select both units, click a destination, then deselect one, tell it to go somewhere else. And you can see we're moving to two different places. Or if you need to, you can always merge them like so. Let's talk about uh, naval movements real fast. Navies are divided into three broad categories of ships. Heavy or capital ships, light ships, and transports. And moving units by sea requires transports. And I'm going to show you both ways to move your units by sea. So the first thing I'm going to do here is split this stack to demonstrate that if we have three transports and if we have three or fewer brigades then we can click this button to load the unit onto the transport fleet and just like so it's now in the fleet. Now you can't see them in the fleet but if you click the fleet you'll see that this unit can now carry zero out of three weight and if you click this button which is a little bit deceptive you can see those three units right here. Now, if you're to select these units and then click back on Venice, they'll just disembark. And then you can re-embark them like so. Moving units by ship is the fastest way to move units from one province to another. And uh, if I were to demonstrate, we can have this naval unit go out. I'm going to shift-click, go to Udine, 
or you could just click on Udine, that works too. And in this case, I'm going to send this unit and have it walk to Udine. We'll see who gets there first. So I'm going to unpause. As you can see, they both arrived on the same exact day. And that was just a single province. Now, if we were to go from, say, Venice to Senj, that ship would get there way ahead of the unit that's walking. So, here, even moving a single province, it took just as long. Moving multiple provinces will be a whole lot faster. Here we have another alliance offer from Furtenberg. Let's go ahead and accept. So, as I mentioned, if you click a unit, you can embark it. You can send that naval unit wherever you want it to go and drop the units that way. Now, if you have more units than will fit on a ship, here we have uh, six brigades total. You'll see this button is now different than it was before. Let's compare. So here it's load the unit onto the transport fleet. It just shows the ship and the arrow. If we have more units than will fit on the fleet, now it's going to split the unit to put some of the units on the fleet, but not all of the units. So in this case, half that unit will move onto the ship. So let's click it. You can see there's nine left. There's nine now on the ship, and these can be moved around as before. Now there's an important caveat here, which is if you are not playing with the beta patch, if you are playing multiplayer, and if you are not the host, then you should never click this button. That's a lot of ifs. So in single player, this is fine. In the beta patch, this is fine. And if you're the host, this is fine. If none of those three things apply to you, then you should not click this button. And the reason why is because if you're in a multiplayer game and you do this and you're not the host and you are not using beta, then your units will be bugged and uh, basically you'll be unable to move those units until the game rehosts. So if you really need to move those units and then you just can't move them ever, that's a big problem. So a different way to move your units around by ship is like so. You can move your fleet to a sea province that's adjacent to a land province or some units that are in a land province. And uh, as you can see here, we've got six units, we've got three transports. If I click, it's not going to let me move those units onto the transport. But if I have three or fewer units, I can now embark them directly. And doing it this way takes a lot longer. As you can see here, it's the 7th of January. It's gonna be the 19th of January before they arrive on the fleet. So 12 days to embark them this way. So it takes a lot longer, but um, if you are playing, as I mentioned, without the beta patch, are not the host, and it's a multiplayer game, then this is the safest way to embark your units. And you can see it takes a lot longer. Now, just for the sake of uh, demonstration, let's go ahead and load them. We'll speed things up a little bit here. It's going to take 12 days to arrive on the 19th. All right, we went to the 20th. Anyway, as you can see, we've still got our three brigades on that fleet, and... Um, we can, if we want, uh, disembark them by landing that fleet wherever it needs to go. Or you can select the units in the fleet out in the sea province and then right click to tell them where you want them to go, just like so. And uh, we can assume it's going to take about 12 days for these units to land. Alright, so that's the basics of uh, naval transport. Um, obviously, you're going to have other ships that will be defending your transport fleet. And uh, it's nice to have a mix of heavies and light ships because the light ships tend to be fodder for the heavy ships which do all the damage. So that's the basics of movement. And um, uh, one other thing to mention, if your ships are unable to land in a province, let's say that uh, I was at war with the Popple States, for example, um, then you can't just sail your transport ships into port to drop your units off. So in that case, what you would have to do at the very least, is uh, disembark them from the naval unit that's out in the sea province. That is, uh, load your units, move them adjacent to the province, select the units like so, and if we were at war, I would right-click, and those units would disembark after some number of days. So, um, once you have control of a province, then you can land your fleet within that province. All right, so that's the basics of movement. Let's talk about diplomacy for a moment. When you have diplomatic offers, they're going to show up right here. And you can see at the moment there are three alliance offers. You can click each of these, and uh, in this case, I'm just going to accept all three. Tuscany offers an alliance, Modena offers an alliance, and Krakow offers an alliance. Now, why did these three nations offer alliances? This is single player uh, for demonstration purposes. 
If I go to Diplomacy, you can see the great powers listed here. Uh, the top eight nations by score are great powers. You can see that Austria starts as a great power. Underneath each nation's name in the great power list, there may or may not be a list of flags. These flags are the members of the sphere of that nation. The United Kingdom starts with an extensive sphere. Prussia has a lot of North German minor states in its sphere. Austria has uh, much of Central and Southern Europe and Northern Italy in its sphere. And uh, Spain does not have a sphere, Russia does not, and so on. Uh, nations can be added or removed to spheres in a way we'll talk about later. But you can see that all three of the nations that just sent me alliance offers were in my sphere. So aside from being nations that are generally on good terms with uh, whoever happens to be their sphere leader, uh, these are also nations that were, will share resources, and you'll also be expected, if you're a great power, to defend the nations in your sphere. Now, that's not always the case in multiplayer, but that's the expectation. You can see here, if we sort relations, and this is every single country in the game right now, there's 131 countries if we sort by rank. And if we sort by relation, we can see that the nations that have the highest relations tend to be the ones that are in our sphere. So you can see, we can also sort by sphere of influence. We can see all the nations that are in the Austrian sphere, and see all the nations that are in the UK sphere, and so on. Now we'll talk more about spheres later. You can also uh, do it this way. You can filter by all nations, neighbors, spheres, allies, so on. And if you click on a province within a country, you can get a sort of general overview of their diplomacy here in the bottom portion of the province window. So here I click Brandenburg. We can see who are the rightful owners of Brandenburg. We can see who owns it, Prussia at the moment. We can also see all the different nations that are in that sphere of influence. We can also see who their allies are. That is, if we were to attack Prussia right now, it's really likely that every single one of these small nations would hop into their defense. On the other hand, the sphere members that are not allied to them are not going to hop into their defense. But uh, we like Prussia right now. We can see our relations here are 125. Relations range from minus 200 to 200. So we're going to send Prussia an alliance offer. Now there are a few different ways to go into diplomacy. Probably the easiest way, whether using the beta or not, is to click on a province within the country and go to diplomacy. If you are using the beta, then you can right click anywhere in the country if you do not have a unit selected. If you have a unit selected, it's going to try and walk to that position. But if you have nothing selected, you can right click. Another way you can do it is to go to the diplomacy window, which is clicking the tab up here. And you can either find Prussia in the Great Powers. If it happens to be a Great Power, it's right here. You can sort by name. We can look for the P's, click Prussia here. Or we can sort by rank. And we know Prussia is going to be ranked fairly highly, so we can click Prussia there. In any case, we have Prussia here is highlighted in the diplomacy screen. We can see our relations. We can see their government, etc., etc. Uh, let's send them an alliance offer. If Prussia is played by an AI, then uh, you should be able to see whether they are going to accept and why. So in this case, we have high relations, we're neighbors, we're historic friends, they will accept, we'll send, send them the offer. If Prussia were a player, right now they'd be getting a pop-up right here with a diplomatic offer of an alliance. Prussia is not a player, so the AI is just going to decide on its own whether it wants to ally. When the AI either accepts or refuses a diplomatic offer, it takes a day, so we're going to run the clock for one day. Here you can see they accepted our alliance. When you're allied to someone, you share vision. So they can see my units, I can see their units, and we have shared fog of war. Now Prussia is not allied vicariously to my allies. So for example, I'm allied with Tuscany. I can see Tuscany's units, we share fog of war. Prussia is not allied with Tuscany, so even though they are allied indirectly, uh, they do not share vision. Now another thing to note, when you have a sphere of influence, you also have vision over your sphere. Bavaria is in my sphere, but they're not my ally. But because they're in my sphere, I do have shared vision with them. In general, it's a good idea to ally with your sphere members. Because uh, if I were to be attacked, if someone were to justify on Austria and attack me, all of my AI sphere members would get a call to arms and would very likely join in that war in my defense. And it's obviously better to have more troops than your enemy does. On the other hand, if I have a sphere member, for example, Bavaria, which is under my sphere, but not my ally. If I get attacked, they will not come in to join me. But if they are attacked, I will still be expected to defend them. So in general, it's a really good idea to ally your sphere members. There are some cases where you won't want to ally your sphere members. For example, 
if uh, your spherling is about to be attacked, you know they're about to be attacked and they're more of a liability than anything else, you might just let them be attacked and not intervene. But in general, you will want to defend your sphere members. So we talked a little bit about diplomacy. We'll talk more about spheres of influence later on. The thing I want to talk about next is perhaps the most exciting part about Victoria 2, which is warfare. We're going to talk about the absolute basics of how to go to war. So since I'm playing Austria, and since I'm going to be a role player right now, I'm going to kill Serbia. So let's pull up diplomacy with Serbia. And to do that, I'm going to click on the province, go to diplomacy. There are a few things you want to keep track of when you're declaring war on a nation. You'll notice this area right here changes what information it shows when you change tabs in the diplomacy screen. Now, <clears throat> you can see that Serbia is being protected by the Ottoman Empire. Now, why is it being protected? If we go to show great powers, we can see that Serbia is in the Ottoman sphere. As I mentioned, if Serbia and the Ottomans were allied, then if I were to attack the Ottomans, Serbia would come to their defense. Serbia is not allied with the Ottomans, but because it's in the Ottoman sphere, the Ottomans will still come to their defense. Now, if it's a player, it might not. If it's certain circumstances, the AI might not. But in general, you should expect the sphere leader to come to the defense of the spherling that's being attacked. So if I attack Serbia, Ottoman Empire will be assumed to hop in. Now, if we look through the other great powers, we can see that Russia is also friendly. Friendly nations can be a wild card and they can ruin your day. And uh, what I mean by this is if I were to attack Serbia, Russia, not being an ally, can't jump in right away. But if I were winning a war against Serbia, and if I have a war goal against Serbia, and if the Ottomans have not added a war goal of their own, then Russia could decide to hop into the defense of Serbia because they're friendly. So that means I'd be fighting Serbia and the Ottoman Empire and Russia essentially by myself, which would be a really bad idea. Now, friendly nations don't always jump into the defense of nations that they're friendly with, but you should assume that they're going to. Now, there's one important thing to note, that if Russia were to jump into Serbia's defense, Russia would not be able to add any war goals of its own, with one important exception, which we'll talk about later. But you should always proceed with the assumption that any nations that are friendly are going to jump into their defense. And this is something that a lot of new players have trouble with. So, if you don't pay attention to who the friendly nations are, you're going to be caught by surprise and get intervened on and probably have a much more difficult war than you were expecting to have in the first place. But for the sake of demonstration, let's go ahead and declare war on Serbia. So you can see right now the declare war tab is grayed out and that's because if we go to show wars, we don't have a casus belli. A casus belli or CB is a reason to go to war. If you don't already have a CB against a nation, then you're going to have to fabricate one. And this is where the justify war option comes in. There are a few different options here. If you mouse over and hold your mouse over it, it'll give you a quick description of what each one does. Now, because we want to take over Serbia, we're going to have to do a conquest. It's going to take approximately a year to justify this war. And we can see that the maximum amount of infamy that we can get is 22. Infamy is something that a lot of new players have trouble with. If you go up to the politics tab, you can see this red flag, which is your infamy indicator. Right now we have zero infamy, and you can see underneath it says zero of 25. Every month we lose 0.1 infamy, which means that if we take a full 22 infamy for this justification, then we're going to have about 18 years or so worth of infamy to burn off. Now you see that we're losing infamy regardless of whether we have any or not. So it's always a good idea to have some infamy that you're burning off. That is, if we keep our infamy at zero, then we're wasting infamy. Now, everything that you justify for is going to cost infamy, and different things will cost different amounts of infamy. For example, uh, Conquest of Tunis, aka Established Protectorate, only costs 10 infamy. So this is going to take a lot less time to burn off. But if you aren't burning it off, you're just wasting potential infamy loss. So you might as well do something. Uh, just so you're not wasting the infamy. Different justifications cost different amounts of infamy. We can see that a humiliation only costs three infamy, but a humiliation does not allow us to annex Serbia. And making a puppet or cutting down to size costs intermediate amounts, and a conquest costs the most. In general, CBs against uncivilized nations cost less than CBs against civilized nations. Also, taking colonies costs a lot less than taking states. But let's go ahead and justify on Serbia. 
We're going to go to Conquest and proceed. Now, let's run the clock. It's going to take about a year to justify this. So you can see here, very soon after the justification started, I received 21 infamy. So, if we go to Diplomacy and we go to War Justification, we can see our justification against Serbia. There are other nations also justifying right now, but if they haven't been discovered, then they won't show up here. When someone has been discovered, they'll show up in the War Justification tab. You can also see your allies' justifications here. We were about 5% of the way through, so we took approximately 95% of that 22 infamy as actual infamy, and you can see that's been added here. So 21.0 infamy was added, and now we're burning it off at 0.1 per month. Now, you can see underneath here, we've got 21.07 out of 25. 25 is a magic number. At 25 infamy, everyone thinks you are literally Hitler. And at that point, people will just start declaring war on you just because. Depending on the mod, other terrible things might happen to you as well. But at minimum, everyone else in the world will get a free CB against you to contain you. Containment is really bad. And if it's AI, you will often have coalitions forming against you, and you will get contained over and over and over. That is, if you get contained by, say, Russia, Russia can come in, beat you in a war, and contain you. Once you're contained, your army is dead, and then France will declare war on you, and they'll contain you. And then Prussia will do the same thing, and then the Ottomans, and then two Sicilies will even do it, because you have no army left at that point. So containment is a really terrible thing to have happen to you. Unless you are an experienced Victoria player, you never want to go over 25. Of course, there are exceptions, but for a new player, someone who's not experienced, uh, don't go over 25. Just don't do it. So anyway, we're safe because we're under 25 and we're burning it off at 0.1 per month. So let's run the clock some more and uh, we'll let this justification finish. In the meantime, I'm going to click select all my units like I demonstrated, and I'm going to move them down to the Serbian border. And again, this is just a very quick demonstration of how wars work. So we'll go over more specifics and country setup later on. So I just received my CB against Serbia, which allows annexation. Which means if we right-click on Serbia to bring up diplomacy, we can see Cassus Belli here is conquest. In most mods, Cassus Belli's last for one year, with some exceptions. So we can see right now it's 2nd December 1836. This conquest will expire 2nd December of 1837. So if we were to wait exactly one year, then that CB would be gone, and all of that infamy would be wasted. That is, I'd have the infamy, but would not have gone to war, and definitely won't have that land. So, basically, you need to be ready to go to war as soon as you have a CB, or at least be aware of how long you have to declare war. Now, during the past year, I received several additional alliance offers, and I accepted all of them. So, you can see here I'm allied to Prussia, I'm allied to Denmark, several others that were not already allies. I'm going to be calling them all into war. So when you declare war, you can see here in the bottom, if you mouse over, who is protecting them. Serbia is protected by the Ottomans, but uh, no one else. We can click here in the top right. We'll see what our CB is, that is, what our actual war goal is. We'll see how much it costs, and we can see the CBs here. Now, in some cases, you might have multiple options, and you would have to select which option you want. For example, if I were acquiring a state from a nation with multiple states, then I would have to select which state I'm declaring war for. Here in the bottom, we can see a checkbox for Call All Allies. Okay, so I'm re-recording this section of the video because I feel like I went a little bit too far in depth when it comes to uh, the mechanics of war. So right now I just want to give a very basic overview. I've got my CB again. I've got a number of allies. I'm not allied with Prussia at the moment, but uh, let's go ahead and declare war. If I mouse over Call Allies, I can see that some will accept and some will not. Now the problem is if I click this checkbox and proceed, it's going to call every single one of these allies regardless of whether I already know they're going to join or not. And for that reason, I recommend not using this checkbox whenever you can avoid it. Because it's going to call all those nations into war, and they're going to instantly unally you. Now, you might not mind if they unally you, but if you want to keep those allies, then this is not the way to do it. Let's go ahead and declare war, though. And I'm going to call them in manually, so I'm going to filter the list of all nations to show only allies and I'm gonna go down one at a time and call ally and we'll see which ones will accept so in this way I'm going to avoid calling in those that won't accept Parma and so on when we get to the more distant nations that are not in my sphere we'll see that they're less inclined to help so I'm not going to be calling these nations that way we're still going to remain allied so only the willing participants will be called in 
and everyone else will stay out. So I've called everyone in, and it's still day zero. That is, the war has just begun. If they're a player on the Ottoman Empire right now, they would receive a diplomatic action pop-up right here, telling them that their Sphereling has just been attacked, would they accept the call to arms? And if it's a player, they have a choice to answer yes or no. The AI is obviously going to answer yes. Now, something I forgot to mention, uh, before you go to war, you always want to make sure you check your spending because when you're at peace, oftentimes you'll keep your military spending at about 30 to 40%. You want to make sure that your spending is cranked up to 100% before you declare war. And when you bump your spending up to 100%, you'll notice that your organization is not at the maximum, so it's going to take some amount of time for that organization to climb all the way up. So it's a good idea to turn your military spending up to maximum at least several months before you actually declare war. And that's what I did in this case. As I mentioned, the Ottomans have been called, but they have not yet accepted the call to arms. And I have called in my willing allies. They have not yet accepted the call to arms. But on day zero, I'm going to go ahead and start my troop movements. Now because Serbia is a small country with only four provinces, and I've got five units here ready to siege, I'm just going to tell four individual units where to go, and that'll be the end of that. I'll have this unit in reserve, defending this particular unit in Bor. And the reason why, these three provinces have nice defensive bonuses thanks to the hills. Bor does not because it's a plains province. So assuming the Ottomans decide to attack me, it's very likely they'll be attacking me in this exposed province of Bor. So that's the one I'll be defending. So let's run the clock for one day. And we can see, one day after war was declared, all of the calls to arms, we can see exactly who joined the war. So on my side, everyone that I called joined, and I expected them all to join because the game told me whether they were going to join or not. If we go to recruitment map mode, we can see that Serbia is trying to mobilize right now. Their mobilization progress is 6%, and they have three brigades that are going to appear in Belgrade. Now this is very unfortunate for Serbia for reasons we'll see in a moment. But uh, let's go ahead and run the clock and we'll see what happens. So, when a unit moves on top of a hostile unit, battle begins. If you click on the battle indicator, you're taken to the battle screen. For the current phase of the battle, we see the dice roll for each side. This is a general indicator of how much damage you're going to be doing. We see the effects of individual generals on either side. If you mouse over the flags, you'll see the effects of tech and tactics, and any terrain modifiers that might be present on either side. We can also see the battle lines on each side, including infantry, cavalry, and any artillery that are present. After battle has been initiated, battles will proceed for about two weeks before either side can retreat from the battle. But in the meantime, additional forces can come in. So I'm going to show you what happens when this unit comes in. Now the line gets expanded. When new units come in, they don't always join the formation in the most efficient way possible. And it can take some time for units to reorganize in a more meaningful way. Anyway, let's go ahead and run it. You see, the enemy's, the enemy's lost all of their org at this point. The enemy was overwhelmed and lost all of their organization, and so they were stack wiped. That is, the entire unit was lost. So they weren't able to hold out for the necessary two weeks in order to retreat to a different province. Now, what we have here is a stack that just appeared on top of my units. I mentioned the mobilization was taking place within Belgrade. This is one of those three mobilized stacks, and unfortunately for Serbia, it spawned on top of my army that was already occupying Belgrade. So this unit will be very quickly wiped out. And just like that, one of the three mobilized units is gone. The take home here is that if you think you're going to be going to war, mobilize early. Because if you wait to mobilize until it's too late, you might get Blitzkrieg, just like I did here. And at that point, your mobilized units are just going to suicide into the enemy. Now, it's unlikely that Serbia would have been able to do much anyway but uh, you always want to give yourself as much of an edge as possible. And if you lose your mobilized troops for no reason at all, then uh, you know it's just a waste. Now here in the west we can see some of my allied troops are now coming in to assist, uh, but also something interesting has happened. I mentioned before the war started that uh, when we looked at the great powers we saw that Russia was friendly with them, and because I'm winning the war against Serbia, and because I have a war goal against Serbia, Russia joined the war in defense of Serbia. Now, if Russia were a player before they joined the war, when they looked at show wars, they would have seen that this plus sign would have been lit up in green. And that means that you can join a war and intervene on that side. So if it were a player, it would have clicked right here and then uh, clicked accept to join the war on the defending side. So what does this mean? 
Well, uh, Russia became the war leader on the enemy side. So before I was fighting against Serbia as the primary war target and Ottomans as the war leader. On my side, I'm the war leader because I have the highest military score. But now that Russia has joined, they have a higher military score and they've taken over as war leader. So I can piece out the individual members, but if I want to end the war entirely, then I have to piece out with Russia. Now, because Russia intervened in the war, uh, the only thing that this side can currently impose on me is the status quo. So if they win the war, they can't add anything else. They can't take any states from me. But what they can do is uh, force a white peace. The same thing has happened here in Texas. That is, Mexico tried to annex Texas. And the moment they got the tiniest bit of war score, the USA jumped in to defend them. So the USA can't take anything from Mexico in this case, but it can prevent Mexico from annexing Texas by imposing a white peace. Now one of the reasons I wanted to start this part of the recording over was because in my previous attempt I was allied with Prussia, and when I called Prussia into the war, they actually became the war leader. The nation on either side of the war with the highest military score becomes the war leader for that side. And because Prussia is ranked number 5, and I'm ranked number 9, they became the war leader. A war leader can negotiate peace with anyone on the other side, so I can negotiate peace with any of those three nations. Russia can negotiate peace with all of the nations on my side. But for example, Serbia can't negotiate peace with Krakow because neither one of these is a war leader. Now the reason I didn't want Prussia to be a war leader was because when I went to peace out Serbia, I couldn't show you what sort of diplomatic options were available. Also, something to note, if you call in a war leader before you call in your other allies, because you're no longer the war leader, you can no longer call in allies. That is, only the war leader can call its allies. So if we look at Russia, we can see that Russia is allied with both France and Netherlands. So if Russia were a player at this point, they could call in both of their allies because they're the war leader. But even though the Ottomans are allied to the UK, because the Ottomans are no longer the war leader, they're no longer able to call in the UK to defend them. If the Ottomans had called in the UK before Russia joined, then the UK would have taken over as war leader, and the UK could have called in every single one of its allies, and often a player UK will do this. So be aware that if the UK gets called in on either side of a war, you've got a lot of Indian miners that are going to be coming your way. And the same thing applies in the case of Austria. So Austria, being the current war leader, called in all of its minor allies. But if I had called in Prussia first, Prussia would have become the war leader, and then I would have been unable to call in all of these allies. On the other hand, calling Prussia in would mean that Prussia could call in all of its allies. And if you stagger the calls to war, Austria can call in all of its minor allies, then call in Prussia on a separate day. That is, you have to wait at least a day for nations to join a call to arms. So call in all of the minor allies, run the clock for a day, let them join, then call in Prussia. And if Prussia were a player, it could then also call in all of its allies. So this is how you can get all of the nations that are in various spheres into a war simultaneously, but it's something that's often overlooked. Let's go ahead and continue with the war for now. When a unit moves into hostile territory, you'll see a bar appear below the unit, and this will slowly fill up. And if you mouse over it, you'll see it represents the occupation progress. It's also shown when you click on a province here in the top right portion of the window. When the occupation progress reaches 100%, you now have control over the province. We see that the first occupation is just about finished. All right, so Bor was the first province to be occupied. And uh, what I want to show you now is that if we mouse over the CB, which is Annex Serbia, we see that it's fulfilled in 25% and currently 0%. So what does that mean? You may recall when I started this war that the war score cost of annexing Serbia is 85%. The maximum war score that you can impose in any given war, assuming you don't separate peace, is 100%. So if I were to force a peace in this case, there are only two ways to go about it. Number one is to get a 100 war score against Russia and peace them out. Or number two would be to accept a white peace, and that's not assuming any special cases, which we'll be talking about later. So I need 85 war score, but as you can see, Serbia doesn't account for a whole lot of war score because if we mouse over the war indicator in the diplomacy show wars, we see that the attacker occupation is only 0.2. So from plus 0.2, if we imagine that each of these is approximately 0.5, adding all of that together is nowhere near 85%, right? But if we occupy at least 75% of the war score, then we'll start to get a ticker. 
And we see an indicator right here representing 85%. That is, the sum total of all war goals that have been added on either side will show up as an indicator. Um, on the defensive side, their war goal is actually worth zero, so it shows up at the zero line. But our war goal is worth 85%, so it shows up way over here. It also indicates how much war score you can get in tickers. So let's go ahead and occupy the rest of Serbia real quick. Okay, so Serbia has been fully occupied. If we check diplomacy again and then we mouse over the CB, we'll see that now Annex Serbia is fulfilled 100%. And we also see that currently zero has something next to it, and that is a daily change. So every single day, this ticker is going to go up by 0.063% to a maximum of 85%. So if you just sit and wait long enough, eventually this number will tick from zero all the way up to 85%. But that doesn't take into consideration other modifiers. So for example, battles have a cumulative score that can range from plus 50 to minus 50. So if we get 85% in tickers plus 15% from battles, we can force a piece. Also, occupations for both the attacker and the defender have a cumulative score, which is added to the total. Blockades also have a minor impact and can be sufficient to tip the war one way or the other if you're very close to the necessary amount to force a piece. The take home here is that there are any number of ways to force a peace. Now obviously if Russia were a player, at this point I could try and negotiate some deal with them and they may or may not peace out. But if you're fighting against an AI, an AI will almost never peace out for less than an actual war score cost. Now we're going to talk more about strategy later and we'll talk more about special cases later. But just for the sake of demonstration I'm going to show you a couple of things. Let's go ahead and continue the war for a few months just to see what happens. See that the Russians are moving a stack into Boar. And I'm going to be attacking them from two sides. Now there aren't flanking bonuses in Victoria, but uh, just being able to pile more units into a battle does make a difference, so that's what I'm going to be doing here. You can see I'm just completely destroying them. Unfortunately, I'm taking heavy losses in this battle, and that's because I have a terrible general, a minus two <laughs> with a zero roll, versus a plus three attack. When you click on individual units, you can mouse over and see the stats of the general that is leading that stack. And you want to have some idea of where your good generals are at any given time. And unfortunately, this minus two general actually had higher prestige than the other one that I just moved into battle, which means that particular unit is still leading the battle even though this is a better general. And as you can see, if we mouse over, we'll see why. We've got a very good attack general leading a defensive. If I click on the battle, I can see that it's going to be two more days until I can retreat. Now, I could retreat all of my units, but there's really no reason to do that because I still have a defense position. I'm doing a lot of damage to these Ottoman troops. So what I'm going to do instead is cycle the troops, and this is something we'll talk about more later. And that is, if I wait until the day that I can retreat, I've actually got a really good roll here, so I'm going to keep these troops in for right now. But uh, when this roll goes south, I'm going to move these troops out. And it looks like the Ottomans retreated before I had a chance to reinforce it, which is fine. Anyway, let's check the war score. You can see I've got 5% against the entire enemy coalition. So the 5% war score counts against the entire enemy coalition, but if I click on individual members of the enemy coalition, I can see what my war score is against them. So for example, I've got a 0% war score against the Ottomans, but against Serbia, I've got a hundred percent because they're fully occupied. You can piece out individual countries on either the attacking or defending side. It's also possible once a war has started to add additional war goals against the defenders. But this requires that you individually have a positive war score against either the enemy coalition or that particular belligerent. If you're able to add war goals against a particular member, the add war goal button will be lit up in green. This will depend not only on your war score, but also on whether you have sufficient jingoism or if jingoism has been disabled by the mod that you're using. Um, the last things I want to talk about right now, and we'll get to more advanced things later, is uh, how to peace out. When you click a nation that you're war with and you go down to the bottom, you'll see proposed pieces lit up. And we can see that uh, they would not accept the offer to annex Serbia, but they would accept the offer to enforce their war goals, which is status quo. So if this war were just dragging on for too long, or if we, we were at risk of losing for whatever reason, I could go to offer peace and accept their terms. As you'll recall, because this was an intervention, 
Russia cannot add anything else. Even if this were a player, they would be unable to add any other war goals. In fact, no one on this side can add any war goals now because of the intervention. Accepting a status quo is much better than letting your entire country get destroyed over the course of a war. On the other hand, we can impose separate pieces on the individual belligerents on the enemy side because we are the war leader. So if I click Serbia and I go to propose peace, you'll see that I can annex Serbia because I have a 100 war score against them. 100 war score allows you to impose any war goals you have up to 100%. If you have over 100%, you can't impose them all unless the war goals are on separate belligerents. But because we have a single war goal on Serbia and it's less than 100, we can go ahead and do that. And what you'll notice now is the status quo has changed and the Russian Empire now wants northern Serbia back. That is, this is no longer an intervention war, now it's a liberation war. And because this is no longer status quo, it actually means that both Russia and the Ottoman Empire could potentially add war goals on their side if they wanted to. And we can also see that the peace terms have changed. So I no longer have any demands because I've already achieved my demands. On the other hand, offer peace is no longer a white peace. Uh, going back to the status quo requires Austria, in this case, losing Serbia. We'll talk more about special cases later, but mostly this was just for the sake of demonstration and to show how to piece out individual co-belligerents. We've gone over the very basics of unit movements, diplomacy, and warfare, and we'll pick up in part two with setting up your country at the start of the game. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.